good news, good news. Always good news. Good news, good news. Good news. There is good news today. All of no matter what else is happening in the world. Always good news. Good news. There is always good news today. Welcome to Good News Today, the program where you will always find good news, no matter what else is happening in the world. I'm Jim Dearman, your host for Good News Today. Let me tell you what's coming up on our program today. Another Challenges segment comes your way following our devotional time uh, with Stephen Hall. Our uh, devotional time, incidentally, consists of our scripture reading, beautiful singing, and then a brief study of the scripture. And today, uh, it's Acts chapter 9. We're going to read the first 12 verses, a portion of the conversion account of Saul of Tarsus, who became, of course, the great Apostle Paul. And following that devotional time, the uh, segment with uh, Stephen Hall, where he uh, uh, deals with the challenge of being sure of your salvation. Can we really be sure of our salvation? Well, Stephen will deal with that in another excellent Challenges segment. And what about alleged contradictions of the Bible? You may have heard of alleged contradictions, but you know there's a vast difference between an alleged contradiction and an actual contradiction. And that will be the topic with which um, David Smith will deal in his excellent Be Ready Always segment that we're featuring today. And uh, in our final segment today, our GNT Q&A, the question is, please explain the statement that the church has no earthly headquarters. You may have heard, uh, heard us uh, make that statement at some point, that we have in the Lord's church no, uh, no earthly headquarters. What do, we, uh, what do we mean by that? We'll, we'll talk more about that as we answer that question, as always, from the Word of God. And as always, we are so glad that you have joined us for another edition of good news today. Let's read the first 12 verses now of Acts chapter 9. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. If you could see Christ standing here tonight, his thorn crowned head and piercing hands to view, to see those eyes that beam with hands of mine, and hear him say, Beloved, was for you.
We're back for the study portion of our devotional time. We looked at Acts 9, verses 1 through 12, and of course that is not the entire account of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, but um, we do want to hit some highlights here and bring in some other passages as well. Of course, the entire conversion account of Saul is uh, revealed to us not only here in Acts chapter 9, but also Acts chapter 22 and Acts chapter 26. We get some more information from Saul's own perspective uh, after he, of course, became known as the Apostle Paul. But here he is a zealous persecutor of Christians. He is yet unconverted, of course, and uh, he has asked letters, verse 2 of our text, from the high priest uh, to go to the synagogues of Damascus to see if he found any, as the scripture said, who were of the way. In other words, Christians. The Christianity is sometimes in scripture called the way. Then notice it says, whether men or women. Let me ask you a question. Why do you think it doesn't say whether men or women or children? Well, because there were no children in the church. There were no children who were Christians. Children are not uh, are not accountable until they reach, obviously, an age where they know sin and realize sin has entered their lives and uh, are old enough to understand and obey the gospel. Well, what does that say about infant baptism? What does that say about the erroneous Calvinistic position that children are born in sin? You never find uh, children in the church. Children uh, are innocent. They're born in complete innocence. And so you don't find the scriptures speaking of those who were Christians as being men, women, and children. It's only men or women of accountable age. But he journeyed, and of course, that's when the Lord appeared to him here on the Damascus Road and asked him the penetrating question, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, initially, Saul did not know um, with whom he was uh, uh, speaking here when he asked, Who are you, Lord? He used the word Lord as a term of respect, realizing he was talking uh, to someone who was obviously superior to him. And then the Lord said, I am Jesus. He identified himself as Jesus, the Lord, whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goats. Then in verse 6, so he, Saul, that is, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, and now he knows it's the Lord Jesus Christ to whom he is speaking, Lord, what do you want me to do? The Lord said to him, what? Pray a prayer and you'll be saved here on the spot. No, arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. In other words, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus does not take place here on the Damascus Road. The process only begins here with Saul, who is obviously penitent now. He obviously uh, confesses that Jesus is Lord. He calls him Lord and he wants to know what else must I do? Well, if prayer was the only thing that remained, why didn't the Lord tell him that? And I bring that up because of the predominant uh, thinking and teaching, tragically, in the religious world today, calling itself Christian, that that's how one brings oneself into covenant relationship with Christ, by praying a prayer, the, the so-called sinner's prayer. There is no such prayer found anywhere in Scripture. And the example of Saul of Tarsus is a beautiful example to clearly point that out to us. In fact, over at verse 11 of our reading, where the Lord appeared, appeared to the uh, disciple Ananias, he said, Go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. The Lord knew that at the time he was praying, but praying was not going to be sufficient to bring about his salvation. It's not praying, it's obeying that we learn from Scripture that brings us into covenant relationship with Christ. Now, Saul was doing the only thing he knew to do. It's the very thing I would have been doing under those same circumstances, and probably you would too, and that is praying, because he knew nothing else to do at this time. He had not received further instruction. Now, when we read on in verses that we have not included in our reading today, down at verse 17, Ananias does follow the Lord's instruction. He goes to him, lays hands on him, and says, Brother Saul. And when he says Brother Saul, he's talking about Brother Saul as a fellow Israelite, not as a fellow Christian at this time, but as a fellow Israelite, a term that was often used in Scripture for a brother Israelite. Romans 9, verse 3 is an example. Romans 7, verse 2. 
uh, we find instances where brother is used, where a fellow Jew is obviously under consideration. He's not saying to Saul, you are my brother in Christ at this point. And so, what does he tell him to do? Well, we mentioned that Acts 22 gives us information from Saul's own remembrance, Saul's own inspired uh, a record of it when he is now the Apostle Paul. And there he says, when Ananias came to me, here's what he told me. He said, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Was Saul of Tarsus saved on the Damascus road? No. If he was, the Lord didn't know it because he told him to go into the city of Damascus to the, this place where he would be visited by a disciple named Ananias who would come to him and tell him what further action he had to take in order to become a Christian. He was praying, that's all he knew to do. But if he was saved, think about it. He wasn't rejoicing. He wouldn't eat or drink for three days. I call that not rejoicing, but one who is obviously filled with guilt. But that guilt was relieved when? When he followed Ananias' instruction. When he arose and when he was baptized for the remission of his sins, thus in that process, calling on the name of the Lord. That's what calling on the name of the Lord involves. It involves obeying, not praying. And that obedience consists of a belief, yes, in Jesus, that leads us to repent of our sins, to confess Jesus as the Christ, and then to be buried in baptism for the remission of sins. Well, that's all the time we have for our uh, devotional time today. We encourage you to spend more time with that text in Acts 9. Also, the uh, other text uh, on the conversion of Saul, tying in that other information in Acts 22, and also over in Acts chapter 26 as well. Right now, it's time for the Challenges segment, where, speaking of salvation, Stephen Hall reminds us that we can be sure of our salvation. Here's Stephen Hall. Are you sure of your salvation? Did you know that the Bible tells us that we can be sure? 1 John 5 and verse 13, John tells us that he wrote those things to us so that we may know that we have salvation. You see, God wants you to be secure. He wants you to be sure that you are saved. And we can know, according to the Scriptures, that we are saved. I'd like for us to note what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10. When Peter says, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. Now notice that in light of what Peter had just written in 2 Peter chapter 1, we find that Peter is writing about the Christian graces. And he admonishes his readers to give diligence or heed to these characteristics. Diligence simply means to hasten. It means a zeal of earnestness in the pursuit of those qualities that are essential to the Christian life. Now the calling and election that we find, we receive because it comes by God by way of His gospel. The calling is when one hears the gospel preached, Romans 10, verse 12 through 14. It is the election or the divine selection or the choosing of God that we receive when we obey the gospel of Christ. You see, God elects or chooses those who respond to the gospel call, to the gospel invitation. And we respond by believing and obeying the gospel of Christ. But notice that Jesus said in Matthew 7 verse 21, that not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And also in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 and verse 9, the Hebrews writer writes that though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of salvation to all them that obey him. So we must understand the importance of obedience in answering the gospel call. But notice that God's grace, even though it is offered to everyone, can be declined. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, we read that God wants everyone everywhere to be saved. However, in Acts chapter 7, verse 51 through 53, we read of the attitude of those who refuse and reject the gospel of Christ. But yet, once we obey the gospel of Christ, as Christians, 
and individuals, we are directly involved in securing our election by simply answering and doing what we must do in obedience. You see, the specific area of obedience discussed by the Apostle Peter is that of acquiring, using, and developing those Christian graces. Notice, if you will, in 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3, that Peter writes, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby we are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that Peter tells us to add to our faith. Faith is the foundation of the Christian life. He then says that we are to add virtue, that is to say the determination to do right. To virtue we are to add knowledge, that is to learn. To knowledge we are to add temperance, the ability to hold oneself in, self-restraint. We are to also add to temperance patience, the idea of giving a positive resistance to evils and to bearing up under them. And to patience we are to add godliness, that is to say, a humble reverence and a deep piety toward God. And to godliness, we are to add brotherly kindness, which is a warm, genuine, unfeigned love. And then we are to, of course, have greater love, that is, agape love, the bond of perfectness, according to Colossians 3.14. Agape love is a love that is given that expects nothing in return. Now, if we sincerely and zealously develop these spiritual attributes, then we will be found faithful in all aspects of our Christian lives, in work, in worship, in teaching, and in all of our duties. But if we do not do these things, then what is, of course, the answer? Again, I'd like for us to notice what Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. After he has written of these graces, he says, Wherefore the rather, brethren, Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. Now, if we do these things, we will never fall. What then is the opposite of these things? If we don't do these things, then we certainly cannot stand. Today, have you made your calling and election sure? Our thanks to Stephen Hall for the Challenger segment excellent study on being sure of our salvation. Well, coming up, it's Be Ready Always with David Smith as he deals with the alleged contradictions in the Bible. They're not real contradictions, but uh, he'll deal with the alleged contradictions that some claim exist in God's Word. But before we get to David, let's get to a brief information break where we want to give you some contact information, and we do want to hear from you. We'll be right back. You may have questions or comments about Good News Today. We'd like to hear from you. Or if you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address is Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee 37327. That's Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee 37327. You may prefer to email us at goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. Good That's goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. Or call us toll free at 1-877-384-7221. That's 1-877-384-7221. We'd like to hear from you. Hearing from our viewers is always good news to us. Well, right now it is time for us to join uh, David Smith for another Be Ready Always segment, where, as we mentioned earlier, he deals with alleged contradictions in the Bible. Here's David. In verse Peter 3 and verse 15, we are told to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts 
and to be ready always to give an answer to every man that would ask us for the reason of the hope that is within us, and then to do it with the right attitude with meekness and fear. Hi, I'm David Smith, and this is Be Ready Always. You know, as, a, as believers, we often run into critics of the Bible, and critics love to try to point out discrepancies in Scripture, to try to shake the faith of people who believe that the Bible is, is from God, and we should do that. And, and one of the things that critics love doing is to try to point out what they believe are contradictions in Scripture. And if we're not prepared, sometimes they can be troubling. And for many, they have shaken the faith of those folks. In Matthew 5, 17 and Ephesians 2 and verse 15, there is one such alleged discrepancy in the Bible. A critic might point to Matthew 5, 17 where Jesus says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. Then in Ephesians 2 and verse 15, Paul says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. In some newer translations, the word destroy in Matthew 5, 17 is translated abolish. And so we end up with Jesus saying that he did not come to abolish the law. And Paul in Ephesians 2 saying that's exactly what he came to do. And a critic of the Bible might say, aha, see I've got you, that's a contradiction in the scripture. Well, we want to be prepared for that. So how would we go about answering, being prepared for such a, a challenge as that? Well, first of all, let's look at, at Matthew 5 and verse 17. In this passage, Jesus said, I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. The word destroy there means to trample upon. It, it means that Jesus did not come to do despite to the law of Moses. He didn't come to dishonor what God revealed through Moses. Instead, Jesus said he came to fulfill it. In fact, in verse 18, he said, For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle, that would be like our dotting of the I and the crossing of the T, will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Jesus came to accomplish the demands of the law of Moses for redemption, which would be the shedding of blood, to give himself as a ransom for many. And that's what he did. And when he did that, the law of Moses was fulfilled and taken away even down to the jot and the tittle, the dotting of the I and the crossing of the T. Over in Ephesians 2 and verse 15, Paul is simply making the point in this passage that there are new conditions of pardon because everyone now is reconciled in one body. Let's take a look at that scripture again. In Ephesians 2 and verse 15, Paul says, "...having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, Verse 16, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross. Now that's the church. The church is, is the New Testament assembly of people. So in the New Testament, there are new conditions of pardon. Paul's point is we are not justified by the conditions of the law of Moses. We're justified by the conditions of pardon in that law of Christ, the faith of Jesus Christ as he will explain in the book of Ephesians. There's no contradiction between what Jesus said and what Paul said in Ephesians 2. In fact, one complements the other. Jesus said, I came to fulfill the law of Moses, and when I fulfilled it, I'll take it away even down to the jot and tittle. Paul picks up where Jesus left off and said, that's exactly what he did. And because there is now the church, there are new conditions of pardon, and everybody's reconciled in that one body by that, not the law of commandments contained in ordinances, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. We could go back to a passage like Jeremiah 31, and we could even see in the law of Moses that the law of Moses predicted its end, according to Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34, to show us that the law of Moses, the Old Testament, was never meant to be a once-for-all covenant. So if someone says, isn't there a contradiction between Ephesians 2.15 and Matthew 5.17, now we're ready to say, no. They're both teaching exactly the same thing. In fact, between the two, we get the full picture of Jesus taking the law out of the way, having fulfilled it, and new conditions of pardon that allow us to be members of the body of Christ. I'm David Smith, and this is Be Ready Always. Coming up, it's our G&T Q&A and our uh, question. Uh, Please explain the statement that the church has no earthly headquarters. We'll get to that after we get to another brief information break. We'll be right back. You may have questions or comments about Good News Today. We'd like to hear from you. Or if you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address is Good News Today, P.O. Box 206. 
Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. That's Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. You may prefer to email us at goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. That's goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. Or call us toll-free at 1-877-384-7221. That's 1-877-384-7221. We'd like to hear from you. Hearing from our viewers is always good news to us. We're back for our final segment. Incidentally, we do want you to be sure and take advantage of that contact information and let us hear from you. Uh, we do receive questions. We're getting into our question and answer segment right here in our final segment. Uh, we do receive questions from our uh, Good News Today audience, and you may have a Bible question with which you'd like for us to deal here in this uh, segment of our program. So uh, let us hear from you by uh, email if, uh, if possible. That would be great. But um, choose any uh, way you, uh, you like to uh, get in touch with us. We just want you to get in touch with us. And we do encourage you to enroll in our Bible Correspondence course if you haven't done that already. So many have done so. And uh, we'd like to uh, add you to that list. Uh, it's strictly based upon the Bible, nothing more nothing less. Well, here's our question. Please explain the statement that the church has no earthly headquarters. Well, we have no earthly headquarters because we have no earthly head, for one thing. Uh, in the Ephesian letter, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, the Apostle Paul there writes, uh, and he, well, this is God, who put all things under his, Christ's feet, and gave him, Christ, to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So our head of the church is not an earthly head, but the heavenly head. Christ is the head of the church. And each congregation is completely independent or autonomous. There's no earthly headquarters. There, there's no ruling body. But the creed, our rule book, is the New Testament. And each congregation is organized according to the New Testament pattern, which is independent and autonomous. Philippians 1 verse 1 gives us the full organizational structure of the church, where Paul and Timothy write, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Bishops, another word for elders, and the deacons who are the special servants under the oversight of those elders. And each congregation is to have elders, and the deacons work under them, and every member subject to them. Every congregation completely independent, cooperative, but independent. That's why we have no earthly headquarters. Thanks for being with us. Always good news, good news, good news, there is good news today. Good news, good news, the world. Always good news, good news, good news, there is good news today. All around the world, good news, the world. Always good news, good news, good news, there is good news today.